One of the most successful entrepreneurs in America over the past 50 years is going public with his fourth and final prediction about a scenario he calls America's nightmare winter. You've probably never heard of Bill Bonner, but in addition to owning an interest in businesses all over the globe, he also owns more than 100,000 acres with massive properties in South America, Central America, the US, plus three large properties in Europe. Bonner says, we're about to enter a very strange period in America, which could result in the most difficult times we've seen in many, many years. Bonner has made three similar predictions in his 50 plus year career, and each one proved to be exactly right. Although he was mocked each and every time. That is why I strongly encourage you to read about Bonner's fourth and final prediction, totally free today. It's all spelled out in a free report we've put together about America's nightmare winter scenario. Get the facts for yourself. Go to AmericanWarning2022.com to get your free copy of this report. Even if he's only partially right, it will dramatically affect you and your money. So again, www.americanwarning2022.com. Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It's September 8th, 2022. It's a Thursday. We get a big show coming up. We get an interview with Jamie Rogozinski. He's the founder of Wall Street Bets. 10 years ago, believe it or not, Wall Street Bets was his idea, and it's grown into something huge. So we're going to talk to him about what Wall Street Bets is and where it's going in the future and more coming up right now on Making Money. Again, this is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It's September 8th, 2022. Beautiful day down here in South Florida. And as I mentioned earlier in the open, we have a great guest for you today, Jamie Rogozinski. He is the founder of Wall Street Bets, going all the way back to 2012. He's also an author. Uh, he wrote a book in 2022 about his journey, really, with Wall Street Bets. You know, the community of Wall Street Bets really came uh, into the headlines. Uh, during the COVID shutdown, as a lot of young people started uh, getting involved in investing uh, through gamification, uh, Robin Hood, um, looking for kind of anti-Wall Street ideas, if you will, kind of going against that. You know, in 2019, Wall Street Bets had over 800,000 subscribers and more than 3 million monthly unique visitors. Uh, so Jamie built quite the community there with Wall Street Bets, and it continues to grow and it continues to evolve. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Jamie Rogozinski. Jamie, thank you so much for being here. Obviously, we just gave a little introduction. Uh, quite the uh, career you have so far, and still a very young gentleman, and so quite the career you have in front of you. Um, tell me a little bit a bit about how just kind of Wall Street bets came about. You know, I, I I am a novice when it comes to Reddit and all this stuff. Obviously, I've I've known more about it in the last couple of years. But how did this all come about, and how did it really? go from you starting it to the phenomenon that it became? Well, Wall Street bets uh, started off as like almost like a philosophy, right? It, it found a, a large home, obviously, in Reddit. Um, but it, in around 2012, give or take, is when I uh, created the idea, the concept behind Wall Street bets on Reddit, on, on social media. Uh, but it started slightly before then, right? I think that that philosophy was ingrained in my head, or at least like the seeds were planted in around 20, 2009, 2010, during the financial crisis, I'd lost my job unemployed. Then I finally got a job in DC, working in a bank of all places uh, that was actually paying very well with a good disposable income. So, you know, I decided, and, and I would walk past, you know, I'd get off the Metro and I'd walk to, um, uh, to my office every day and I'd walk past Occupy Wall Street. And so I'd have this really present in my mind, this, this taste in my mouth of, having been unemployed for a while, going through the hardships, looking at people that are upset at the whole system and me finally getting a job at a bank, right? So like, so I've, I've, I've managed to get on the inside, right? And then, and then I think to myself, hold on a second, there's no difference between Wall Street and whatever everyone else is trying to do. I'm going to go ahead and learn how to use the market in the same way that the, the banks, the investment banks, the traders, so that I don't have to go through that again. I wanna get rich, right? Uh, and I couldn't find, you know, there's resources online for people that want to do responsible investing. And there's resources online for people that want to become professional traders, which is a craft and it's a difficult one. 
I wanted to have fun with it, take a lot of risk and get rich as fast as possible, understanding that I could also lose uh, my money as fast as possible as well. So <laughs> boom, Wall Street Bets was born. So, you know, your book that came out um, in 2020, uh, Wall Street Bets, How Boomers Made the World's Biggest Casino for Millennials. Talk about that a little, how the boomers uh, really created uh, this phenomenon that, that, that is Wall Street Bets, that is this casino you referred to for millennials. How, how did this all come about? Yeah, so th that, that book embodies a lot of the sentiment that I'm talking about, the, the, the idea that there was a series of events uh, generationally speaking, that, that, that altered the way that we look at the world. We meaning I'm a millennial, and then obviously the books refers to the millennials and, and um, millennials on down, really. It should include also uh, Gen Zs. What happens is, I think it's around the financial crisis. I could go back to the day that the stock market started getting really philosophical, but really the stock market, what it did is it, it left a lot of people in a bad place. A lot of students, a lot of millennials that were in college at the time or, or um, about to be in the college or just graduated, can't get a job, have these loans to pay off, right? If they get a job, it's not paying well. They're moving in with their parents' basement. They're not getting married as, as young and they're not having as many kids. They're, you know, they're not living life the way that it was meant to be, the way that it was uh, pictured, right? It's, it's harder. And so you get this kind of fend for yourself mentality that, gave rise to influencers, to the gig economy, to shared economies, you know, the Uber, this, that, the other, like, I don't need to have a car. I can just rent these little scooters, uh, a hustle and I'll, and nobody's going to have my back. Right. And, uh, and so you, you've already got your demographic and your audience primed for this. And so that was one cause. And, and I blame the boomers, uh, in the sense that they were the ones running the show when when uh, these things took place and the systems were designed. And then you have the, the, the mechanisms by which these millennials start to behave the way they do with the market. The mechanisms being regulation that allows uh, all sorts of really elaborate, creative, dangerous, uh, speculative, whatever you want to call it, these things that anybody can use. Uh, and then you have brokers that become very accessible, both in the interface, like meaning easy to understand, uh, they run on your cell phone, they are instant, they are free, free commissions. And so the, 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 the barriers of entry are practically eliminated. And, uh, and then you bundle everything together and you do put social media into it where people like to collectively contribute and create. And it's, uh, the, the, you know, Wikipedia, the open source software, you have all sorts of crowdfunding, et cetera. So that whole thing, you mix it all into a bowl, and this is exactly what you get. So let, let me, you know, I'm, I'm a Gen X, right? I think it is. I'm, I'm on a borderline of millennial Gen X or whatever the hell that means. Um, but I've, I've been in the market for 20 some years. So, I, I, you know, I'm a little different than probably average Gen Xer. I have a lot of friends, you know, early 40s, mid 40s, family, do well, seven figures in the bank. Um, and they're afraid of the market still because... You know, my generation lived through 2000, the tech crash. Then we had to live through, obviously, the financial collapse of 07, 08. Real estate came down. Uh, then we had, obviously, COVID. So three, basically, some, some serious bear markets. And, and, and for people that, that don't have the risk tolerance, they, they think the market's the scariest thing in the world. Then you throw in millennials that have lived through a couple, you know, obviously, ups and downs. But a lot of millennials have lived through a big bear market until COVID. And suddenly you had COVID happen and then, you know, whole Wall Street bets, a lot of people coming in, as you mentioned, Robinhood, you could buy fractional shares for free. It's, it's just so easy on your phone. And I'm torn and I'd love to get your view on this. I'm torn because half of me says this is great because it gets a younger generation invested in the stock market and, and realizing that it's one of the greatest ways for the average American to um, make the money they work hard for work for them. That being said, the other part of me, Jamie, says... This is pure freaking gambling, and it's probably bad because most people are going to be losing money and don't even have a worse taste in their mouth when it comes to investing. What is what? What do you what do you say about that? Uh, it it is gambling, right? Like it's it, the, the the word in Spanish for trader, like stock trader, is literally speculator. In fact, the word speculator was the word for trader in English, at least when Jesse Livermore wrote, wrote his famous book back in the nineteen thirties. 
Um, that, I mean, it's, it's, they're all educated guesses, right? The difference between an investor and a gambler is literally the risk tolerance. You, you know, we, we all know that risk and return go hand in hand. If you want to uh, take a very, very safe investment that's unlikely or, or yeah, that's, that's uh, improbable, unlikely to lose money or a lot of money, then most likely that investment is also only going to make you a little bit of money. If you do a all or nothing YOLO, all right, this thing that everyone's afraid of, this 100% loss, uh, uh, that means you can also make 100% win or even more in a lot of cases, right? But the, the, the so, so it's just semantics. People guess at the market, Warren Buffett guesses, and he gets it wrong as well, right? Um, and so once you have that slider bar defined, then you're really just kind of left with the idea that you have different participants using the market in their own way. I think the only people that should be worried about the market are the ones not that have a lower risk tolerance, or perhaps you can interpret it like this, but the, 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 the lower time horizon. Stocks only go up. Dave Portnoy made it very abundant and, I, and, and, and it's very profound. It makes a lot of people upset sometimes because it's like, no, they don't. Look at all these examples. And I'm like, yes, they do, because then keep looking forward, right? Uh, you can go back to the Great Depression and the stocks kept going up. The, the, the question is how long it took to recover, right? So the people that need their money in this window, those are the people they need to worry and they need to do that in an educated fashion. But what's cool about the millennials that are getting into this is yes, they're gambling, they're irresponsible, having fun, you name it, whatever. But when they're in their 60s and whenever they're looking at the, uh, you know, at their pension, they will have already done the gambling, right? And they will already know a heck of a lot more than most people that are currently in their 60s having to face it. I, I know more about the stock market and every type of financial instrument that I ever dreamed to know of. Uh, and, and then the last point, what I'm meaning as far as what the effect is on the market, the mechanics of it, like I don't see anybody asking a high frequency computer algorithm, you know, what their thoughts on <laughs> keep speculating because they're doing it too. They're just using a different technique, right? Like their time horizon is like a millisecond from now. So like, Everyone's, you know, this this is a place where everyone can participate. And, uh, and the more people participate, the more liquidity, the more efficient, and the, the more robust it becomes. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I, I want people to participate. I just, you know, I, I managed money for 17 years, an investment firm I sold last year. So I dealt with real investors and real money every day. And it, it's, it's amazing that I had a, like a, a handful of clients, Jamie, that if they called and said, Matt, we got to get out of the market. It was probably a day or two from one of the great buying opportunities of the year and vice versa. It's, Matt, why aren't we fully invested right now? It was probably time to kind of probably pull back. We're going to have a pullback in the market because we tend to, you know, be sheep and travel in these big herds. Um, and, and that's, I guess, the one thing that scares me is when everybody's on one side of a trade or investment, whatever you want to call it, or speculation even, uh, it typically is the wrong, wrong side to be. And, you know, during this whole 2020 thing, I, I had so many people that never talk to me about stocks ever calling me about, you know, should I buy GameStop? Should I buy Bed Bath & Beyond or AMC, whatever it might be? So I, I guess I just, it's, it scares me a bit, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist. So I'm taking, a, you know, and, and you make a really good point there about people learning the hard way right now, and hopefully not with a lot of money because they're still young and being able to, when it comes to their fifties and sixties, invest in good companies for the next 30 or 40 years and have a nice retirement ready to go. Yeah, I mean, like it's counterintuitive, right? Because you can say, hey, a college kid can't afford to lose 100 bucks. And I'm like, well, yeah, I guess I can understand that the, the, the per unit, right? Like the marginal benefit of a dollar to a college student might be a lot higher uh, than to a 40 year old. But it's 100 bucks, right? Like I've lost a tremendous amount of money learning. <laughs> But I'm thankful I got I, that I got it out of the way a decade ago because I would have lost a heck of a lot more money now, right? Is a percentage of my disposable income. So, uh, you know, even I was a little bit late to the game. And I always say, look, the best thing that can happen to somebody when they start trading is to lose money so that they can become humble. And the absolute worst thing is for some unexplainable reason, the most likely scenario is that beginners make money. And they're like, that's a joke. The first one's always free, right? <laughs> like you yes. get in there, you make money and it's like, you're hooked. And um, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. All right, good. So let's talk about let's uh, some current events that are going on. There was an unfortunate situation last week where a executive of Bed Bath & Beyond 
jumped off an 18 story building, uh, the Jenga building in, in Manhattan and, and obviously passed away. Um, hitting the stock this week, um, obviously Bed Bath & Beyond is one of the, the, the meme stocks, if you will. Do you have any view on, let's say, Bed Bath & Beyond, GameStock or AMC, the actions that we've seen as of late? Because obviously, you know, you're uh, you know off the highs. They're all down about 55 to 70 percent off their all time highs from earlier this year. Uh, not all time highs, but their highs from this year. Uh, even the meme ETF MEME is down about 56 percent off its high from earlier this year. Do you do you see that as 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 something that's dead, or will there be new stocks that kind of take their place, or will these stocks come back? Do you think? Well, I'll, 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 I'll at least break your question down into at least two categories, which is what you started, right? The, the tragic situation behind the Bed Bath & Beyond CFO. I, I have not read the details. I have not caught up as to specifically his case, but I'm very well aware of the context, right? So so I am left with assumptions to make. Um, but because I haven't fully read it, I, I, I will caution to be careful. But if I'm right about my assumptions, meaning this tragedy took place because of what's happening to the company and to the stocks and to its roller coaster that it's been through, uh, then it's very sad. It's very unfortunate. It is tragic. Uh, it's, it's uh, you know, it's a sobering reminder, right, that behind some of these numbers that flicker on the screen, there's human beings and, and, and the actions that people take. So, um, you know, and, and it's happened before. It happened once with Robin Hood, where, where uh, younger individual uh, also took his own life because of a, well, just as tragic and it doesn't really matter. So uh, that's that. But that aside, with regards to what's happening with the memes and this and that, the other, look, me, the, the retail traders are here to stay. This idea that the stocks are up or down are, as far as I'm concerned, irrelevant because, you know, when you go into your Robinhood account, you're picking your stock options. It says, hey, where do you think the stock's going to go today? Up or down? And you like click it with an arrow and it's color coded. The, the people that are speculating and gambling, they're literally red or black on roulette. Like, I don't <laughs> care. Like, if it's the world burning, let's burn it. Okay, let's push it down. In fact, in 2020, Wall Street bets uh, was, you know, they went short like crazy. And, and stocks go, when they fall, they go, they fall faster than when they go up. So the stock options, that's especially rewarding. So they were making a ton of money and they were feeling guilty because they're making memes about the world coming to an end. And then they end up donating like charity drives. <laughs> uh, so then they turn back around. They started long it like, you know, they get hurt during the transitions, right? When the market changes from one to the other. And I anticipate they'll get really hurt when the market, uh, when the market just kind of uh, trends uh, sideways. But regardless of that, it's, it's not this macro level thing. They're not waiting for dividends. They're waiting for their stocks to expire on Friday, right? Like, so. Uh, I, I don't know how much that plays into effect. And then finally, the big one that you're addressing is the meme stocks. Me, the, the concept of the meme stock has understandably been associated with the retail movement because it, it, in that the retail participants are large numbers. They all get together, they organize, they collaborate, and then they can actually have an effect, a significant effect on the market. And usually in the way of buying stocks so that the price goes up, right? Like as if that's the only variable. And, and that's kind of a mistake because Wall Street bets existed for nearly a decade before GameStop. And throughout that decade, the community had been fine tuning all of the techniques that they actually implemented with like precision, with surgical precision uh, with GameStop. It was more than just buy button and uh, people that like the, the, there's been some journalists that have done a good job at actually detailing all the different things. And so what is that? What do all those words mean? Is that these millennials are out there to, to to find inefficiencies for arbitrage? What the what do they call them? Instead of big words, they call it cheat codes, right? They call them loopholes. They call them where can we get attendees? And if they spot something where they have a, an advantage over the other participants, they will go ahead and exploit it, share it, and refine it. In GameStop's case, it meant buy the stock, right? Mm -hmm. Before GameStop case, it meant get infinite money, like infinite buying power. You know, before that, it was like you know, use these uh, commission free platforms that never existed to, to allow you to take these hypothetical trades uh, that, that, that are only that only work on textbook because commissions don't exist. And therefore, brokers never protected against it. And therefore, you put an experiment to real life and they'll continue to do that. So, so they're not going away. It may not always look in the way of buy the stock. 
And then the very last thing that I'll say, which I had not anticipated, is now the market is actually coming towards the retail traders in an incredibly surprising way. When I started Wall Street Bets, I was mad at Wall Street, lost my job. You know, I wrote this big blog post talking about how these exotic leveraged ETF, synthetic, whatever, lots of words were dangerous and they were accessible. And, and then I realized, wait on a second, like, I'm not going to write this angry thing. People are outside my office camping right now for a month and they're not getting anywhere. And I was going to read my blog post. If I want to affect change, I need to actually outrage the system and I need to make them pissed off and, and have them fix it. I think that Wall Street Bets is very successful with that. I anticipated that the system would become outraged and the system, you know, meaning legislators, regulators, Wall Street themselves would say, hey, get these children out of our play yard. How come they're allowed to do this? And then they would have actually made changes to, that, that would affect everybody. Uh, I did not predict what actually ended up happening, which was legislators having congressional hearings, uh, sitting down with the brokers and, and, and all the market participants saying, hey, dear brokers, why did you disable the buy button? for these children that were gambling, right? Like, I'm like, wow, okay, I did not see that one coming. Uh, and, and not only that, I, th I think that because it is gambling, speculating fun, there's an element of uncertainty in there. And these banks, these institutions, they are so used to using multi-syllabic jargon behind stuff that is not that complicated. Um, uh, but it's like this, this masquerade at the hype behind. And now they're jealous of the fact that this particular group of people, these, these retail traders can actually call things what they are and say gamble and YOLO and, you know, let's let's go for gold or moon or tendies or whatever. Uh, I, I just recently got word that the Chicago Mercantile Exchange is working. Uh, I'll, I'll hesitate to, to give the full detail, but it's, it's a financial product with counterparties and regulation, the whole nine yards, which can only be used for gambling, right? Like futures, stock options, you can make cases and arguments that yes, while you could use them for leveraging gambling, they also serve a production financial purpose. They're working on something that is straight up gambling, right? And I'm like, okay, cool. And they put a big word around it, of course. Uh, that's awesome. And AMC, I think is the one that most stands out out of all of them. This is a company that is embracing the movement of these the shareholders from their publicly traded company and catering to them as, as, as their mandate, as their fiduciary duty <laughs> requires them to do in a way that is just silly. And, 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 and the news is struggling to cover what they're doing, but they're actually doing their job in a really roundabout, in a, in a Wall Street bets type way. So now you have companies that are running themselves as if they are Wall Street bets. I just, I love it. You know, I'm not advocating buying AMC by any means, but it's a $4.3 billion company that is estimated to make about $5 billion next year. So it's not as if, um, revenue-wise, it's still losing money. It's, it's not as if it's a company that's not actually doing anything. And, and, if, and if the movie industry comes back, they're going to be poised to do well. And so they, they do have a, a swinging chance, if you will, in my opinion, versus some of the other companies out there that you know, have revenues, a, 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 you know, a pipe dream, you know, where this company was a real company and, and could be a turnaround yeah. story. Look, they got a mulligan, right? The whole world got, you know, beat up by the, the pandemic uh, and, and certain industries more than others like them. But they also were, were a company that was struggling. A lot of companies, when they struggle, they reinvent themselves, the product lines, the efficiency, the image, whatever. They're working on that too, right? They're trying to stay with the times and involving cryptos and NFTs and doing really fun things. And who knows, maybe some of these efforts will work and some of them won't. Uh, but they're, they're really trying to change their actual business product, but they're also changing what their function is. Like every time that I see on uh, an interview of a CEO on Bloomberg or on CNBC, and they say, dear CEO, when you took rain five years ago, the stock price was at 38 and now it's at 38. How would you ev evaluate your performance, right? They could have literally like, invented the cure for cancer. And as the CEO is answering, they have the chart of their stock price next to their head as if that's the only thing that matters. But that's the only thing that matters, right? The investors invest and their responsibility is to deliver returns or value or whatever words you want to assign. Uh, you know, that, that definition is also starting to change in recent years, but still it's that, that philosophy is already ingrained is let's make the stock go up. So AMC is saying, 
okay, I'm going to do my job. I'm going to pick the right movies and I'm going to make the, let people pay with Dogecoin and make the experience of the product good. But I'm also going to try and make my stock go up, right? Like mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I, I find that like so refreshingly, unapologetically honest. Uh, it's, it's, it's very, very cool. And it, that is cool. So where do you see Jamie, you know, obviously so much has happened in, in the, your, your niche industry you're in in just the last two and a half years or so. What, what do you see next? What's, what's on the horizon for Wall Street bets and meme stocks? What do you think is the next big thing that it could uh, have an effect on the markets? You know, it's it's the last two years have been uh, unpredictably fast. I, a, a lot of the things that were that, that happened in the past two years, I predicted them in my book, at least the tendencies that they, they were already building up. Uh, I think the pandemic and the stimulus check, the whole nine years, uh, GameStop itself uh, accelerated the, the trend that was already on the wall. But uh, and, and so now you have this trend that is going very fast and they're therefore harder to predict uh, further down the road. But I can predict in the nearer term future which is these uh, millennials, these Gen Zs, uh, they like to be in power. They like to be in control. They like to look up YouTube videos on how to change their oil instead of taking their car to the mechanic or whatever, like, you know, do it yourself. And so more people are going to try to participate and not all of them are going to want to do it in this, in the style that Wall Street Bets does. Wall Street Bets is crude. It's very, uh, it has a very high risk tolerance. Appetite for risk is, is not for everybody. And I'm fully aware of that. Um, some people like to go on there just for entertainment to watch other people lose their money or make money. <laughs> uh, but there's kind of this, this, this gap that's left behind, but, but, but uh, between Wall Street bets, crazy gamblers and the, well, I don't want to do that, but I don't mind buying stocks or I don't mind investing stuff. And right now they're kind of left behind and they have to find random influencers or they have to, you know, try and, and put together these things. And so, uh, so I, I, I have a feeling that's going to be the next demographic or sub category of this demographic. That's also going to start participating. That's also going to tr- level down the craziness of wall street bets, retail crowd, right? So the concept of the meme stocks themselves, They'll have meme stocks that are meme stocks because people like it. They like Hertz because they declare bankruptcy, not because it's a solid fundamental company. You'll have the new millennials that'll go in there and say, I'm not buying Hertz because they just declared bankruptcy, right? Like the, the, they'll yeah. use a little bit more rationale behind it and uh, and will be the middle ground. And so how do I yeah. see that coming about? Uh, through entertainment. Um, it, it's something that I've, it's a personal project of mine, but I guarantee you that even if I don't do it, somebody else will. Uh, this is the gamification of stocks, right? What in 2012, or sorry, what in 2010, 20, 2008, uh, people, government regulators, individuals who were upset at the investment mix because they were treating Wall Street like a casino. So here comes Wall Street Bets with the name casino practically written on it called Wall Street Casino. And now everyone all of a sudden kind of accepts it because they, 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 they understand this paradigm shift. And the new insult is the gamification of stocks. Like Robin Hood, how dare you put the confetti animation? How dare you make this thing look addicting? Um, so so I, I believe that's going to be the next badge of honor. It's like uh, games are actually very educational and properly placed. Um, so I'd like to gamify the crap out of the stock market where it's not a simulator, because I agree with you, paper trading is... Uh, doesn't do anything, but it breaks down the elements of the game of the stock market. Teaching, if you've been in this industry forever, it's impossible to teach somebody. But if you break it down to really small elements, like today we're going to trade one instrument and you're only allowed to long it, right? Like that, you've reduced a tremendous amount of variables. And then and then people can learn that particular attribute and um, thereby it'll get attention. People want to learn, people get curious, and they'll end up reading about you know, the Fed monetary, the modern monetary policy. I, I think I think you're onto something. I, and I, the gamification of of many industries to me is is the future, um, because you need to break this stuff down to the average person. And, and you know, a lot of times, especially Wall Street, as you know, talks above people, and they use big words on purpose because they want to confuse the hell out of you because they want to make it feel like they're smarter than you and you can't do this. Um, so. 
Yeah, I think the gamification is great. And another point that you made, Jamie, which which I, again, I'm 100% behind, and, and I think we're already on the way there, is kind of the the, the movement away from maybe the, the, the very high-risk gambling to um, the younger generation maybe taking some of their money and saying, you know what, I want to invest in some good companies here, not as much to quick hit the YOLOs, but maybe invest in some great companies. Maybe I'm going to invest in a, in, in a Rivian that I think is going to be the leading EV maker in the next 10 to 15 years, something like that. And there's not a lot of, let's call personalities, brands, influencers out there that actually do that. So I think there's a huge opportunity out there for people to go after the younger folks to try to truly educate them. You know, not just say, go buy this stock, let's all get behind this, but let's educate people too, because that's going to only make things better and, and give us even more power over Wall Street as we become more educated. So I think that I agree 100% with you, Jamie. Both those are, are trends that I think are underway. And during this decade will be huge by the end of the 2020s. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you already see, it's actually kind of funny to watch some of the established uh, media awkwardly adapt to these things. Like I noticed <laughs> the street.com has like a meme stock, like link on the top and, you know, and they only have like AMC and GME, like I forget. And I, you know, and they, what do you call it? Um, CNBC, like they're, they're trying to do the thing and, and you have, individuals that have been there forever and they're like this is this is ridiculous you know like crypto is bonzi scheme whatever they, they have their they're, they're set and they're they're not wrong in that they have their views and their perspectives and that's the way that that's the reality that they were born into and that reality continues to exist right but there's now new realities that coexist alongside and they're like you want me to talk about what like a monkey picture why would i do that <laughs> But it's, you know, but uh, but I, th I think everyone's feeling that that same tendency as well. Yeah. I mean, I was I was in the mainstream media. I, I had to admit this, but I worked for Fox News for about 10 years on air. And uh, it was it's a joke. It's I think the mainstream media is an absolute joke and it's horrible for, for well, you know, what, you, you know what I think is actually interesting that the, the project, the, the, the same as part of this, this esports gamification, whatever the concept that I'm really pouring my heart into is also what I'm calling entertainment finance. Um, I originally called it entertainment. Sorry, I originally called it new, like finance news or financial news, but I was like, oh, it sounds boring, et cetera. But it's also disingenuous. There's no 24-hour TV show. I don't care if it's Fox or CNN or CNN. They all entertain, right? Because there's like six yeah. minutes of actual information to give and then 23 and a half or whatever hours to to, uh, to keep people watching for it. And uh and it, it is entertainment and they want views they, they, like, you know, one of those news channels, they're fighting for the same ratings. They're qualified in the same manner as NBC. That's got like friends or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so like not fair. Right. And so I'm like, all right, cool. Let's make it entertainment. People actually learn from watching entertaining things. The daily show. That was my source of information when I was in college. Uh, you know, and I enjoyed it and I became more aware of what's happening in the world. And I was able to get a subtle opinion, uh, you know, from this particular host, which I understood the context of his opinion. And, and it was just wonderful. So that's the way that I think that the information should be delivered. I, I no agree. Calling it news, and calling it entertainment. That's, yeah, that's that's a day and age we live in. And that's how people digest it. That's how they di digest entertainment. So before I let you go, Jamie, I ask all guests and you don't have to answer it, but I always ask all guests, if I were to put you on the island of your choice, the greatest island in the world, you and your family, whoever you want to bring with you. And for the next 10 years, but you can't trade any stocks or any assets, whether it be gold or Bitcoin or whatever, but you can buy one. And you can't touch for 10 years. And at 10 years later, you'll get what is. What, what is the one asset you want to buy? It's a fabulous question. I'll tell you what, like I was looking, my kids, uh, unless you're pressed for time, it's, I'll give you a four minute answer. I was uh, looking for some pictures in my Halloween, you know, for Halloween, my kids want to be Jack Sparrow. So I'm like in college and I'm looking through my emails to see if I can find it, one that I'd used. And I bumped into an email that I had sent to a buddy of mine back in 2006 when I first opened my very first broker account. And I purchased three stocks. Um, uh, and I remembered one of them up until I saw this email. Then the other two came up to me. So one of them was Google during their IPO. It was the inspiration for me to open this brokerage account. The other one was Activision. Uh, and the third one had a ticker symbol that I didn't recognize. It was ERTS. 
And, uh, and I'm like, man, I do stocks all day long. And I just don't, don't know that weird. I Googled it. It was entertainment arts, right? <laughs> the video game company. Yeah. So I, I would have done really well with my last, well, it would have been 16 years, I guess. Um, uh, so while I was about to say, I'm no good at this. Apparently my one shot was good. Then again, <laughs> the entire market went up. So I could have probably thrown darts and I would have done all right. <laughs> um, what would I pick if it can only be one instrument that if I'm not allowed to, to make it like an ETF, <laughs> yeah, just I, one, would, just I would one. just make it an, I would just an individual one. I'm going to go for, it's going to be in the tech sector, narrow it down a little bit. Uh, it's going to be, actually, I'm going to give it to Tesla. Yeah. I'm going to give it to Tesla because I believe Tesla right now makes cars. I believe but they also make tunnels and flamethrowers and merchant like apparel and rockets that go to the space. So, and they have a CEO that's bored and has a company whose name is literally bored. Uh, they're not done with innovation. No, I, I, I love that pick. That's a stock that I wrote about about two years ago. It was when it was worth maybe a couple hundred million. I said, this is a $3 trillion company. You know, it was like a 10 bagger at the point. And people are like, you're crazy. It's, you know, this stock that people back then were still saying it's going to zero, that it was like a joke. I'm like, and it's like, this is not a joke. This is one of the greatest innovators in the last several centuries that we can bet, we can bet on basically. Um, so I agree, you know, their energy storage is going to change it. They're solar. Like you said, you know, building tunnels and boring. I mean, there's so much going on. It's, it's unbelievable. And it's, and it's the leading electric vehicle company in the world. Like, come on, let's be real here. This is a real yeah. company. And so, yeah, I, I love that pick for the next 10 years. In, in the meantime, we'll get you back on here soon. But thank you so much uh, for everything you've done for the industry and uh, for taking time to come on the show today. We'll get you back on soon. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure. Take care. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.